as a pastor, you have to look across and and the Lord shows you things in the assembly that are needed. And sometimes that can be tough medicine to take. For all of us, it starts with me before it even comes to you. And I have to deal with it in my own heart um, first in different areas of our life. But, you know, one of the things that I believe can be an extreme challenge and it can be a test of your growth and your Christian walk is contentment in the Christian life. If we are not content in this Christian life, I don't care what is given to you, what blessings God has bestowed upon you, um, whatever you have, the things, money, whatever it is, you'll not be happy with any of those things. You know, your wife can't make you happy in that sense. You know, I mean, she can she can do all that is required of her and all that love requires of her to try to. But at the end of the day, she can't change your heart and make you happy. Only God can make give you that joy. And only you can surrender to the Lord that and say, Lord, I'm going to be content with whatever it is. You know, so... I think it's fitting and important just for the assembly as a whole and also individuals. We look to this as two people starting, becoming one today and starting their life out. This principle, wherever you're at in your Christian life, applies. Being content in this Christian life. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith, let us be therewith content. Father, Lord, we pray t- today that you just would help us. Help us to see this importance, this growth and maturity that is necessary for the Christian. And Lord, help us to be content and be godly. And Lord, be thankful for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, I actually believe that this sermon is is one of the most important and vital topics in the Christian life. I'm going to add it to that Christian life series that I preached a long time ago and just continue to add to it as, as God reveals things. But a Christian, if he is not content, he will not be much of a, a Christian at all, you know, because... We are not, we, we don't live our lives being content merely because of the circumstances that we are in. No, it's, it's the opposite of that. As a Christian, you and I must be content in whatever, in whatever place we are at. And we're going to talk about that and show what the Apostle Paul said about that. I will tell you this, that you will not be a good spouse if you cannot be content. You will not be a good father or mother or church member or pastor or worker in the Lord's vineyard if you cannot be content. You will not be a good employee if you cannot be content. As a Christian, you must be content. I believe it's fitting on this day to talk about this, that we, as we hold this marriage ceremony day and, and we watch these two lives come together, that we understand and we consider some things. I believe, it's, I believe this right here is one of the major problems in any relationship, whatever be that relationship, contentment. And there are people, I want to read you this quote here. There are people who are constitutionally discontented. Nothing gives them satisfaction. They are like hermit crabs and may well be designated crabbed. (laughs) We see that the animal and the shell are mostly well suited to each other, but it is a remarkable fact that however well the shell and the crab may be suited to each other, the crab always thinks that a shell belonging to another crab would make a better house. Consequently, they will wage direful battles over a few empty shells, although neither of the shells would make so commodious a habitation as that which was already occupied. Never pleased, never happy. I, I've met people like that, that, and you have to look at the situation and realize wherever they go in this world and whatever they do, there's always some problem. But they're never willing to look at themselves and realize that it is a problem with your contentment, with contentment in your heart. That is a real problem. Because wherever you go, you're going to have problems. You're going to have circumstances. You're going to have things that befall you. But you know what? Contentment is from God. It is from a peaceful surrender to the Lord. That's where contentment comes from. George Whitfield said this. He said, my dear hearers, there is not a single soul of you all that are satisfied in your stations. 
Is not the language of your hearts when apprentices? We think we shall do very well when journeymen. When journeymen, that we should do very well when masters. When single, that we should do well when married. And to be sure, you think you shall do well when you keep a carriage. I have heard of one who began low. He first wanted a house, then says, I want two, then four, then six. And when he had them, he said, I think I want nothing else. Yes, says his friend, you will soon want another thing. That is a hearse and six to carry you to your grave. And that made him tremble. So George Whitfield's point is that if you cannot be content with what you have in the place that you are in, getting more things is not going to change that. It's not going to make you happier. It never can. So let's first look at the definition of contentment. And we'll get into a ton of scripture here. But content, it means a resting or a satisfaction of mind without disquiet. Contentment without external honor is humility. Godliness and contentment is great gain. It's gratification literally held contained within the limits. It means held and contained within the limits. I can be happy. I can be at joy. I, not disturbed. Quiet of soul. Quiet and at peace in the soul and in the heart. Having a mind at peace. Easily satisfied so as not to repine, object, or oppose. It's being at peace. A lot of people cannot be at peace in their heart. They're always wandering. They're never at peace. They cannot be at peace in their heart because they cannot be content. Yep. It means to satisfy the mind, to make quiet, so as to stop complaint or opposition, to appease, to make easy in any situation. A God-fearing person, a person that is content, can be in circumstances that are not ideal, but they can still get through them and deal with them and press on, thanking God for the place that they are at. It's rest or quietness of mind in the present condition. Satisfaction with holds the, which holds the mind at peace. Restraining complaint. Opposition or further desire, and often implying a moderate degree of happiness. You know, we are told in the Bible to be content, be at peace, be satisfied. A mind that is not conflicted or double-minded, but a mind that is at peace with the relationships, the situations, and the circ even the circumstances that you're under. It takes faith to be content. And we're going to get to that. It's something that you learn. Amen. As a Christian, you learn contentment. You don't just wake up, get saved, and automatically you're content. Paul didn't say that. Right. He didn't say that. And that's why it takes others around to be patient. We're to be patient with one another because they may not have that contentment right away. And you have to be, it's like a child that you know they're not content with the station or the place that they are at, but you as a parent have to still guide them and nurture them and be long-suffering and kind during that process of them finding contentment. It's not easy. And as a pastor, you do the same as you see people. You know they're not content. And they, real, they, they believe that if they had all of these things, that they would be happy. And if they were doing this for God, they'd be happy. And if they had this, they would be happy. And if their wife did this, they would be happy. And if this went this way, they would be happy. And it's not true. It's not true at all. But you have to be patient. And you have to look at them and say, I know. I know what you believe but it's not true. And it is a sure sign. Listen, a lack, you could, you could see a sure sign of immaturity in the Christian life is a lack of contentment. Be it a baby Christian or one that is of gray hair. <laughs> you know, that, that a lack of contentment, a restlessness of mind, not a peace. You could see it on their faces. You could see it in their actions of how they deal with things, how they deal with their spouse, everything, that just a lack of contentment. And we're going to get to how that works out. Listen, I know full well as a pastor, as I pastor you, but that I cannot make you content. I could never do that. I'm not the Holy Ghost. And I'm not the one that has to surrender, in that case, that has to surrender their will to God. 
And we're going to talk about the Apostle Paul in that and how he dealt with that and how he became content and learned it. And, you know, I can fulfill my God-given role and be kind and be a leader and nurture and care and fulfill my office, but I can't make you content. Your wife can be kind and good and godly and have reverence and fear and, and love you and care for you, but she can't make you content. She cannot do that. I marvel that so when, they, when, when someone looks around at, at all, everything and they always have a problem that they never first just look in the mirror and be like, you know, it might just be me. It might be just me causing, causing this because I can't, in whatever state I am, I can never be content. See how I just reversed that verse? See how that was? Paul said he had learned whatsoever state he was in there with to be content, right? He learned it. And we understand that that's a, that's a sign of maturity as well. Only God can make you content and only you can submit to the Lord to do that. It's reliance on the Holy Ghost. It's faith in the Lord. It's a building of your faith. We think of faith as this, we have such a, a slanted view of faith. We don't get the fact that waking up every day, going to work, being faithful to God is faith. It's not just preaching the gospel. It's not just preaching out on the streets. It's not just doing things. No, it is the everyday things of our lives that show our faith. It shows who we are. It shows the character that God has put in us. It shows the work of the Holy Ghost to get up and do the things as a mother does every single day of their lives. It takes faith. That's, that's faith. But we have such a small view of faith. We really don't understand it, but it is the foundation. And then you're to add to that, and that is expressed in your life. It showed. Now, we are commanded to be content. God has commanded you and I as a Christian to be content, to be satisfied in your mind. But godliness with contentment in First, First Timothy chapter 6, verse number 6 in our text verse, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. We brought nothing. And I've never seen a hearse pull a U-Haul yet. Right? Never seen it. It's not going to make you content. You know, we are not to desire to be rich and have everything this world has to offer. Now, being content does not mean that you're lazy. I'm not talking about being lazy. But the desire for riches soon vanish away. The riches soon vanish away. The life wasted. We're not to desire the worldly riches. We're not to desire the relationships this world has to offer. We are commanded to be content. Listen, I want to talk to you about something real here. I'm not going to go in depth with it, but it's important to understand. This world offers a slanted view of joy and happiness and fulfillment. And that's like pornography in a rela with relation. Porn I, I have met many people that the, the world offers you porn and fake women. That's what they offer you. It's not reality. It's not real. It's a fake image. And it's designed to cause discontentment. And when somebody gets their mind so consumed with that or has in the past... I've pastored a lot of young men and a lot, of, a lot of families. When your mind is consumed with that fantasy world and that fantasy life, there is nothing that a wife can do to make you happy. Because it's not real. It's fake. I always like to, I always like to make it very plain to people so they understand, men to understand this, it's someone's daughter. You pig. You pervert. That too straight? Oh, I can be a whole lot straighter. I don't have a problem with it. I really don't. Because it is an absolute epidemic. Yep. It's someone's daughter. It's unrealistic. It's a woman, if she gets too close to the fire, it'll melt because she's made out of plastic. Yep. Not real. As some poor lady that's being abused and taken advantage of. That sold herself. 
You will never be content with a godly wife if you're comparing your wife to the world and what you saw on a forbidden internet screen somewhere. That can bring no joy. You'll never have joy. You'll never be content. Your mind will never be at peace or at ease with what God has given you if you're comparing your wife to that. Your heart will wander. Your mind will dream with an evil imagination that must be cast down. So many young, young men today not at peace with their wives, their marriages, or no contentment. Listen, people don't understand. I'll tell you something right now. A lot of pastors and men today, older men, don't understand what these 20-year-old and 30-year-old young men have been up to. And what they've been saved out of. They, they, they don't fathom it. They don't get it. They don't understand that world. Because, I mean, with the flicker rates, with the, with the, with the addictions to it, with, the, with what it causes, with, with, the, with all of the attractions that it brings, with the virtual reality world that has just completely taken effect. The, the porn industry just said, uh, I was reading on a Drudge Report, I didn't click on the article because I don't trust any Drudge's articles really, but looking at just the headline of it, it said the porn uh, industry gets a bump from virtual reality. And they're lauding the fact that, well, less teenage pregnancies are happening, less teenage uh, fornication. or I, I believe less of that is happening physically because more of it is happening virtually. These kids are turning into nothing but a bowl of mush. Their brains, they're sitting in their basements. All they do is play video games. All they do is look at pornography. All they do is have virtual relationships. It's not going to be anything for them to see people slaughtered and killed and murdered. It is that society. Society that is coming upon us. That's where it's at. And, and if you feasted on that, your brain has been rewired. And you think that's real, and that's not real. What it is, is wicked. Sinful. Damaging. Burns images that can never be erased. fills a heart with discontent that nothing can please you. Nothing can make you happy. And that's why you got to die. You got to die. You have to die to self. That's what you have to do. Because you are not your own. You're bought and paid for with a price. And you must die to self. It's the only way to live unto God is to die to self. And I don't care what age you are. You can have an evil imagination as well and let it run. I don't, it, it can be in a number of different things that can make you discontent. It doesn't have to be even pornography or anything. It can be a number of things. Yeah, money. For the love of money is the root of all evil. People chase it. They love it. They're obsessed with it. They live for it. And then they die for it. Yep. You know, the Bible says to be content with food and raiment. This doesn't mean that we don't work hard and try to reach goals. And doesn't mean, it means whatever the results are from my hard work and my dedication and whatsoever my hand findeth to do, to do it with all my might, whatever the results are, are up to the Lord. If God so gives it, then he gives it. If he doesn't, he doesn't. Amen. It means at the end of my day, I'm at peace with where the Lord has me and what he has provided for me. Hebrews 13, 5 talks about covetousness, and we're going to talk about that in the next point here. But it says, let your conversation, Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness. Right? And be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'm going to expound on that in the next point. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Be content and be at peace with what the Lord has given you. And you look at what he says a few verses up. He talks about whores and whoremongers will God judge. And then he tells you to be at peace with what the Lord has given you. Let your conversation be without covetousness. He says that on purpose. Because Paul knew. Holy Ghost knew. Amen. 
I've heard of a recently a well-known pastor, internet pastor, while well, he was a pastor of a, of a church. He had long since apostated from Baptist faith, in my opinion, and was teaching things contrary, but I won't mention his name because it's not worth it. It's, not, it's none of our business to mention, but, but I've heard recently of a well-known pastor that decided to basically leave his wife or divorce his wife or she divorced him. I don't know what the case is. And he basically ditched his wife, and he's already courting a staff member. Now, whether she left him or not, the point is, if she left, go follow her. <laughs> go get her. Go get her. Go get her. I would think that a church would be godly enough to say, Pastor, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to remove you from office. We'll give you some time. Go get your wife. Go get things worked out. We'll kick it up a notch here. This, the men will take over. We'll help. We'll get you through it. We'll help you. Go after your wife. Amen. You go help your wife. You get, you get things back in order. We'll be here. We'll help you. Now, that's scriptural. That's the way it's supposed to be. And by the way, that's why we don't have female staff members. That might make somebody upset, but that's okay. I've done my best in my ministry to crush feminism. And I rather enjoy it. I mean, I, honestly, I absolutely enjoy it more than anything. It's one, of the, it's one of the highlights, besides preaching the gospel, to stomp on feminism. I, I, I really love to do it. <sighs> and I have to contain myself with it, but I, I, I do rather enjoy it. So it is, I'm content with that. Amen. I'm content with that, with doing that. But anyway, but at the same time, it's because I understand the dangers on both sides. I'm also tired of seeing men not take care of women and love them, you know, because of the vicious cycle. And by the way, in all of feminism and everything else, if you follow anything that I do, one thing you will figure out is I always blame men first. I absolutely, contrary to some opinions out there, I always blame men first, always. Not you, Joshua. I was just kind of, <laughs> sorry. I just want to make sure you, you didn't think I was pointing at you for any particular reason. <laughs> just, <laughs> I didn't want, to, want you to think that. Um, but that's the reason why I don't believe in a female secretary. Right? That's why. Why do you do things the way you do? Because I know what traps are like. I don't want any. I want to keep out of them. I got the devil after me enough. Amen? And when people can't lie, or when people can't tell the truth about you, they have to lie about you. And they have these grand schemes of things. They're like, where did you get that whole huge grand scheme that it took you to do? Oh, I know, because you couldn't tell the truth. That's why. So you had to invent something big. Anyway. Yeah. Always like this big, huge thing. It's like, really? Because like with this situation with this man, I could say it real quick. Well, he's dating his staff member, and he just, and he, he just ditched his wife. See how easy that was? I don't even need a four-hour video to do that. I could just do that in five seconds. Now, it's none of my business, so I'm not going to do it. But the point is, is that that's easy. That's there. That's real life. That happened. Done. You can see it. Why do I have, to have all this other stuff? I'll tell you why, because it's not true. And that's why you have to glamorize all this stuff. Make big, spooky, stupid videos. <sighs> anyway, okay. Yeah, got to make it look good for the camera. All right, next, covetousness is a sign of discontentment. It's one of the things that's very important to understand. One thing that accompanies a lack of contentment is that heart of covetousness. Covetousness, you know what that means? It means a strong or inordinate desire of obtaining and possessing some supposed good. Some supposed good. Usually in a bad sense and applied to an inordinate, inordinate desire of wealth or anything. It's an inordinate, unlawful desire. Not ordained by God. Against God's order, against God's way, and desiring it. Unlawful. A heart of covetousness. It's breaking the command of the Lord. What does the Bible say? Turn to Exodus chapter 20, verse number 17, please. The Bible talks about covetousness. It's one of the first commands, isn't it? Exodus 20, verse 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. 
Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. By the way, that coveting takes place in the heart. First. That's right. It takes place in the heart. And then the actions come. Right? Then the actions come, but they proceed from the heart. You know, everything proceeds from the heart. Out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, evil surmisings, right? All of those things come from the heart. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 5 tells us, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness, which is idolatry. You see why it's idolatry? Because you build this image up of something that you want so bad and you desire so bad that it's an idol to you. And you put it before what is duly ordered by God. And you run after it. Instead of following the Lord. It's idolatry. It is a sin. of it, Covetous, it is the, the sin. It's, it's idolatry. That's the real problem. Most sin is idolatry, to be honest with you. It stems from a heart that wants something that God has forbidden. Right? What do we say sin? All unrighteousness is sin. Right? Sin is the transgression of the law. Right? The Bible says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Your conversation. Now, you, you do know that's not just your speech. The Bible, when it speaks of your conversation, it is your manner of life. It is your everyday life. It is who you are. Every day, let it be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know, the heinousness of covetousness. I want to read you some of the things. The deceive, number one, it is a deceiving sin. Covetousness is very deceiving. Man, you can make a lot of, a lot of excuse, good excuses for being covetous. Oh, man. You can make a ton of good excuses for yourself. You know, you know what I realize? I have a hard time making excuses for your sin. I really do. When I see your sin, I'm just speaking of everybody in this room. When I see your sin, I have a really hard time making an excuse for your sin. But I find it rather easy to make it for my own. Anybody else like that? Man, it just seems like a, tr a human, fleshly, <laughs> fallen nature, a trait of it, doesn't it? I can make a ton of excuses for my own sin, but I can't give you a pass at all for anything. Seems like it's the heart of the matter. It's a very deceiving sin. It blinds the understanding and corrupts the judgment in a main point of happiness. For the covetous man maketh gold his hope and find gold his confidence. Job 31. Is it, it is an insatiable, insatiable sin. In this respect, covetousness is like a dropsy which increaseth thirst by much drinking, and like a fire which by addition of fuel is the more fierce. The desire of a covetous man ariseth from abundance, and in that respect is unnatural. For nature is satisfied with sufficiency. Hunger and thirst cease when a man hath eaten and drunk that which is sufficient. But covetous, no, it's insatiable desire it never it just it fuels a man's fire many men have done a lot of things in the name of covetousness in this world it is a galling sin it works a continual vexation and takes away all the comforts of this life it makes it so you cannot be happy when your heart is filled with that you cannot be happy in anything there is no way for you to be happy and no way for anyone to make you happy. You ever met those people and you're like, I just don't know how to make that person happy. I mean, anything I do, anything I say, they're just not going to be happy. Whatever I do, it's not going to please them. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right, because you can't. And that's when I tell people when I talk to them, and, and I, I, husbands and wives, talking to them and tell them the truth, listen, you can't make them happy. You can love them, and you can give yourself to them, but you're not going to be able to make them happy. They have a problem in their heart, and they need to get alone with God and get it settled. Amen. That's what it is. 
I Listen, I've talked to wives and husbands and sat with them and, and, and felt so bad for them because they blame themselves because they cannot make their spouses happy. They cannot make someone happy. You have to be careful. As a pastor, you have to be careful too about trying to chase around people, trying to make them happy. No, you got to make the Lord, Lord please with you. You got to please the Lord by obeying him and following him because church members are not always going to be happy with your decisions. But you still got to make them. And you still got to you got you still got to obey the Lord. And you and sometimes it has to be enough as a spouse that you know that you've obeyed the Lord, you have followed him and you have loved them and you got to leave it with God. Because you will you will pull your hair out trying to make them happy. And it won't. It can't. It is a problem with contentment and covetousness. It is an ensnaring sin. Wealth, as it is a bait to allure men to snap thereat, so it is a snare fast to hold them. You know, there's a lot of rich people out there that they can't sleep at night. You want to know why? Because their money controls them. They've built up a fortune of things, and they're so worried about losing it that it controls them and it pulls them and everything. There's something to be said for the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus, the simplicity of life, that having your food and raiment therewith to be content. There's something about that. There's a peace about that, that if you can allow yourself, if you can surrender to God and allow that to happen, it won't ensnare you. Covetousness and wealth will not snare you like that and cause you to make decisions that are spiritually wrong decisions to make that lead to destruction. It keeps many from the word too, by the way. It steals away the heart of those that come. It is a mother of all sins. Fitly, therefore, doth the prophet thus style it evil covetousness. There is no evil which a covet, covetous man will forbear when he is driven by his passions and his animalistic desires. He will do whatever it takes to fulfill those. It is a root of impiety. It draws the heart from God. So as there can be no true love nor fear of God in a covetous heart, for gain he will profane anything. Gain, they suppose that gain is godliness. It makes him fear. I'm telling you, you see it in churches as pastors. If they're not careful, they, will, they, will, they have this desire to build something, this desire to own property to validate their ministry. And if they and, and they will do anything to pay that mortgage. No fundraiser, no scheme is too much, no anything they have to do, but they must have that building. And if God asks them to lay that building down and go meet somewhere, they would never do it. Their people couldn't bear it. And I will tell you, the people that cannot bear that are people that have not been trained by their pastor and not been taught what is important in this Christian life. And we lead by example. By God's grace, a long time ago, we said, you know what? If we can't be right with God owning a building, then we will not own one. If we cannot obey the Lord, if we have to become a 501c3, if we have to incorporate our church, if we have to take an EIN number, if we have to tip our hat to Caesar, if we have to do any of those things, that it's not worth it. I don't care where we meet. Listen, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'd still be over in that community center paying 400 bucks a month. <laughs> And would I ever? <laughs> right now I would. <laughs> but they kicked us out. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's neck exploded. I don't know. It was really bad. <laughs> Must have been something I said. I don't know. It probably was. But what's that? Pro probably so. But I enjoyed saying it. Um, anyway, but I would still be content with that. I was content when we were meeting in the Bicey's basement. Amen. All right. I did like that. That was so big. And it was free. I loved that. <laughs> I loved the fact that it was free. Did I mention that? It was awesome that it was free. <laughs> yeah. It was great. I was content with free. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, it was, it was great, though. I'm just saying it was. It was great. It was free. It was wonderful. 
But uh, anyway, but you know, it, it shouldn't, we shouldn't desire. I mean, I've seen churches desire that so much. Right. And, the, and they said that, you know, well, nobody will show up if we do this. And thank God God's raising up some young pastors. We're helping one right now. Brother Jacob's uh, friend, uh, Pastor Andrew Tooney. He'll be organizing, what is it, brother, this week, this month, right? In a, in a week or so? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yep. Yep, I got the documents yesterday. So, yeah, he's going to be organizing soon. So, we praise God. He wants to do it right. Amen. So, we thank God for that. And we're, we're excited about that ministry. You know, a young man that wants to do right, that cared enough to get out there and get the truth out and, and find out about it. And we thank God for it. But, um, but you know what? If, if you met in a basement, if you met anywhere, a church should be happy. Should be content wherever it is. The field. That's right. Amen. As long as we had warm coats and, well, maybe today might be a little rough, but we figure it out. <laughs> but anyway, my van's almost big enough for all of us to fit in it. Not quite. But anyway, it makes inferiors purloin from their superiors, covetousness does, and superiors to neglect their inferiors. It is a cause of much rebellion of many treasons, murders, thefts, deceit, lying, false witness, covetousness. It is a growing sin. The longer men live in the world, the more covetous they used to be after the world. Old men are commonly the most covetous, he says. Herein it differs from other violent sins, which by age abate in their violence. Sometimes the older men get, the more covetous they are. It is a devouring sin. It consumes you. You've met the li- people that are consumed with finance, with money. They're consumed with making it. They're consumed with having riches. And nothing makes them happy. Many times they sacrifice their families on the altar of money. They don't care. It, it's a crying sin. The cries of them which are oppressed by covetous persons enters into the ears of the Lord. Hereupon the apostle bids them weep and howl. Covetousness causes a curse, causes a curse from man and God. He that withholdeth corn, the people shall curse him. Say, oh, I got to wait to get the best price. Let people starve. The wrath of God cometh upon men because of these things, the Bible says. The apostle reckoneth covetous persons among those that shall not inherit the kingdom of God, those that are never born again. They've never been saved. They're never at peace in the mind, never content, always seeking to self-worship or make themselves happy. If you are always wanting and nothing is ever good enough for you, or your wife is not good enough, or your home is not good enough, or your pastor or your church is not good enough, you have a covetous heart. It is from worshiping self. It's really what it is. It's will worship. It's the self, the worship of self. Couldn't possibly lay anything down and be pleased with yourself and be at peace because self is what matters most. You and I will never be able to grow in the Lord like that. You cannot serve the Lord and do anything for God until you have a grateful heart for what God has given you. And I find that God never gives anybody any more until they are thankful for what they've been given. Next, godliness with contentment is great gain. If a man have the life of God in his soul and a just sufficiency of food and raiment to preserve and not burden life, he has what God calls great gain, an abundant portion. It requires but little of this world's goods to satisfy a man who feels himself to be a citizen of another country and knows that this is not his rest. We are not at rest here in the sense of on this foreign soil that we live on. On this earth, in the sense of we are always going to be warring against the flesh and the devil. But the heart should be full of piety. Real faith should be regarded as the greatest and most valuable acquisition you could have. 
with contentment. This word now used refers to that state of mind. Again, being calm. Tyndale gives substantially the same interpretation. He says, godliness is great riches. If a man be content with that, he hath it all. Godliness with contentment. Sufficiency. Right? It's, you know, it show, that contentment shows itself in an outward worship and in all acts of holiness of life and conversation and which the doctrine that is according to godliness teaches and engages to. It is very great gain indeed when a man can be pleased where the Lord places him and what he's done in his life. It's true, solid, satisfying, durable, and unsearchable riches of grace that God has given him. See, you can, you know, I know people that are always looking for something else and never seeing the blessings that are right in front of them. Can, can you please not wait until you've been married for 15, 20 years to realize what God has given you? Let me, let me just give you a shortcut. Please, please don't wait until you're old to realize the blessings that God has given you. Don't waste your life looking, always reaching for something out there and never grasping what is in front of you. That's right. They roam around everywhere. Be content and realize the blessings that God has given you right in front of your face. Right what you can hold on to. Oh, it's worth more than you know. Hmm. A man possessed of true godliness is a gaining, thriving man. Such as are godly are truly gracious. They are coming to good and happy circumstances and are a possessor of the true, solace, solid, satisfying, durable, unsearchable riches. And they are deliciously fed and are in good family, even the household of God, Amen. Who, were, who before were in debt, arrayed in rags, were in starving condition and strangers and foreigners. Yea, they are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, and have both a right and meetness for the heavenly inheritance. They are now made kings and priests to God. It's looking for that eternal reward and finishing the course. It's not looking behind. It's not looking around. It's looking forward. It's pressing forward. It's seeing the future. It's seeing what God has for us, that eternal rewards, the heavenly riches that are in Christ Jesus, that we are already seated in. Ephesians said we are already there. We are already seated there. Though we have a battle on this earth, we are already seen as in heaven. Our riches are already there. They are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, and have both a right and a meetness for the heavenly inheritance. They are now made kings and priests to God, and in this present state of things have God to be their portion and exceeding great reward. Abraham. Abraham was promised all these riches and all these things and all this land, and what did he say? He knew that he looked for a maker, a builder, right? A building not made with hands, a city. He knew where he was going. He knew what God was going to be. And God promised him, and he didn't see the fruition of that promise in his lifetime. They are rich in faith and in good works. Their souls, which were lost, are gained and shall be saved with an everlasting salvation. And ere long they will be possessed of all the riches of glory, signified by a house not made with hands, a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. An incorruptible inheritance. Undefiled that fadeth not away. Right? Where moth and rust cannot corrupt. Amen? And thieves cannot break through and steal. And what adds to this gain and now goes along with it is contentment. For this is not to be considered as the condition of godliness being great gain, as if it was not so without it, but as the effect of godliness that produces that part of great gain. That's the point. The point is that the closer you walk with the Lord and you surrender to God, that contentment comes in. That godliness shows in your life, in your heart. That's what it is. It shows. That's right. And such a man is content with what he has and thankful for it. He submits quietly to the will of God and patiently bears every adverse providence. And that's the fruit and the effect of godliness, of true grace. And that's how gain is godliness. True piety hath true plenty. 
When a man tells you that he is holy, when a man says that he's, or he's walking with God and he's holy, then it'll show in his life. He doesn't have to broadcast it or say that with his mouth. His life preaches that. The wicked in the, in the fullness of his sufficiency is in straits. The God, counterwise, the godly in the fullness of their straits are in all sufficiency. That's why you've seen those martyrs go to their death and they, they, didn't, they, they, weren't, they weren't flailing around fighting, trying to stop it or, you know, cursing anyone or anything. It was the complete opposite. Why? Because they had true peace. Amen. True peace in their soul. True contentment with whatsoever state they were in there with to be content. The utmost that money can do is to procure some outward relief. But piety above will convert every cross into a comfort Amen. and every trouble into a fountain of joy. We are ready to acknowledge that money has its uses and very important uses in reference to our children or dependents. Though it is not unfrequently, it is a curse to them rather than a benefit. I've seen money be a curse to families. I've watched families at other churches I've been a part of have money and chase money. Their marriages are destroyed. Their children have no godliness. They have, they, they have no desire to serve the Lord. And they literally hide their affairs and fly off somewhere and, and commit fornication, adultery. But they were always trying to keep up with everybody else. They're trying to keep up with somebody else because they cannot be content. They got to be rich. They got to be wealthy. They got to have something. One man said it this way I have not wealth laid up for you in my coffers, but I have thousands of prayers treasured up for you in heaven. This is what he said to his family which I trust will come down in blessings on your heads. When I lie moldering in the dust, I have engaged my God to be the husband of the widow and the father of the fatherless. Yes, my dear wife and children, I have entreated him to take care of you, and I believe that my prayers have not gone forth in vain. I say such a legacy would be far better than thousands of silver and gold. Amen. Listen. Don't be a hypocrite when it comes to see either those who profess godliness but manifest a worldly or discontented spirit. The tree must be judged by its fruits. In vain are the highest pretensions to Christian experience if we do not, if we be not dead to the world and resigned to the will of it. Don't put on a show, giving the impression that you're godly while you are not content with what the Lord has given you. It is seen in the countenance that you're not grateful. I've seen in people that, that they fight it, they're fighting it. They cannot be pleased and they cannot be content. The Bible says the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. And a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. The covetous man is ever running out into the future with an insatiable desire after secular good. And if this disposition be not checked, it increases as the subject of it increases in years. Covetousness is the vice of old age. The promise is made to those who are patiently bearing affliction or under persecutions for Christ's sake. And may be applied to any faithful soul in affliction, temptation, or adversity of any kind. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Your contentment must come from your spiritual walk with the Lord, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. It is the fruit of his work. Amen. Knowing that he will never leave thee nor forsake thee, that makes us content. That's what the Bible says. That is what's to make us content, that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know what? Take the long view as well as the short view, said one. Take the view which says it will be all the same 100 years from now. I like what one brother says. It's all going to burn someday. It's all going to burn someday. Amen? All of the possessions you have, the house, the land, the car, the money, or the lack thereof, it's, it's, it's all going to burn. 
It's all temporal. It's going to vanish away just like your life but a vapor. Christian contentment delivers us from the power of circumstances. Listen. It is not a doing without things because we must. That is possible apart from Christian grace. It is a repose and a satisfaction of the heart saying, Thy will be done. You see the difference? To attain it is that to reign as a king over our circumstances. That's the thing. Circum- your circumstances, good or bad, is not what makes you content. If it is, that's a problem. When things are good, I can be content. But when things are bad and don't go my way and there's problems, then I can't be content and at peace. See, you haven't learned it. We haven't learned it. And then think about it for a second and say, oh, well, I haven't learned to be content, which I'm going to get to, by the way. I haven't learned to be content, so that's why this trial is here to teach me to be content content no 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 you're looking at it like no this deal fell through or this happened or that didn't work out the right way or this this happened this way or it's because of this no for we know that all things work together for good to them that love god to them we're the called according to his purpose remember it's like that big cake right if we took that cake that's in there which I tried to do, but it was on my desk. Hey, it was on my desk. I mean, what do you expect? There's a big cake on my desk. I came in, I was like, hey, there's a big cake on my desk. Don't touch it. Okay. Don't covet. Hands off the cake. Okay. But if we took that and we just took some of the ingredients that were in there, like I said to you last week, if we took just some of the ingredients and tried to eat them, we'd be like, this is gross. Ugh. Right? We wouldn't like that. It wouldn't taste good. Right? Yeah, a handful of flour, that wouldn't taste good. No. But when you put all the ingredients together and out comes the cake, it tastes good. It works together for good to them that love God. Right? Now, what are the reasons that we should be content? I'm going to give you a few. To be content is to be in good humor with our circumstances, not picking a quarrel with obscurity or poverty, or our social position. The first is the consideration that the poorest of us have all that is indispensable in this life. We, we make a great ado about all our hardships, but how little we talk of our blessings. Right. You know, when, you talk, when, 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 when our speech is more about the, the complaints and the challenges we have in our life and less about the blessings, we have a problem. We're not content. And our focus is off. It's not where it should be. It's not where it should be. We're not grateful. Our happy, number two, our happiness is not dependent on our outward circumstances. Oh, my goodness. If you think, Aaron, <laughs> you're getting married today, brother, and I love you. So I'm going to tell you, <laughs> circumstances are always going to change. Yep. Yeah. Always going to change. Feelings go up and down. Emotions go up and down like a roller coaster sometimes. Sometimes in seconds. Amen. But you know what? Circumstances are going to change. But that shouldn't change our contentment. It shouldn't. No, it shouldn't. One man said it this way. He said, I find Nero growling on a throne. I find Paul singing in a dungeon. That's right. Think about that. Paul said, what did he say? We're going to get that. What's over saying I am there with to be content? I learned it. We're going to talk about it. I know this is going long, and I'm trying to hurry, sort of, but not really. Um, <laughs> sort of, but not really. But Paul, he, he's in a dungeon, and he's singing. Nero's growling on his throne. I find King Ahab going to bed at noon through a melancholy while nearby is Naboth contented in the possession of a vineyard. Haman, the prime minister of Persia, frets himself almost to death because a poor Jew will not tip his hat. And Ahithophel, one of the greatest lawyers of Bible times, through fear of dying, hangs himself. 
The wealthiest man 40 years ago in New York, when congratulated over his large estate, replied, Ah, you don't know how much trouble I have in taking care of it. Byron declared in his last hours that he had never seen more than 12 happy days in all his life. The heart right toward God and man, we are happy. The heart wrong toward God and man, we are unhappy. Another reason why we should come to this spirit in, in the text is the fact that all the differences of earthly conditions are transistory. They're going to go. They're, they're transitions. This too shall pass. Some, listen, listen, husband, wife, church member, brother, sister, listen to me. The present condition that you are in, the present situation, it will pass. It will change. Sometimes for the good. Sometimes rougher. <laughs> always for your good, but won't always feel good, okay? But your situation is going to change. It's not going to stay the same. That's that you see sometimes the condition that you're in, you think, you know what, this is going to last forever. No, it isn't, you big baby. We're a bunch of babies. We cry like a bunch of babies. Yep. One thing's wrong, we start crying, right? Just like him. Hear him? There's one thing wrong. I don't know what it is, but amen. Not Andrew. I meant the kid. <laughs> I point over to Andrew. It's... Yeah, I, I hear you, brother. <laughs> the houses you build, the land you work, the places in which you barter are soon to go into the hands of others. However hard you may have it now, if you are a Christian, the scene will soon end. Pain, trial, persecution, never knock at the door of the grave. Be thankful for life. Be thankful for the crying baby because the silence of death is deafening. Yep. You hear these children crying and you hear these babies crying, not the big ones, the little ones, but you hear them crying. I'd much rather hear the sound of cries than the silence of death. And that young lady is going to have to learn the hard way too. How hard that would be to learn that. Whatever state you're in there with to be content. Another reason why we should culture the spirit of cheerfulness is the fact that God knows what is best for his creatures. I know. You and I think that we have it all figured out. And man... I've been praying about this, and God's going to do this, and I just want God to do this for me, and this is what I want really bad. Sometimes his children think that he is hard on them and that he is not as liberal with them as he might be. But children do not know as much as their father. I can tell you why you are largely affluent and why you have not been grandly successful. It is because you cannot stand the temptation. If your path had been smooth, you would have depended on, upon your own sure-footedness. I'm telling you, trials, God gives us trials so we stop depending on ourselves. That's why. Because we depend too much on ourselves and not enough on Him. But God roughened the path so you have to take hold of His hand. Amen. Amen. Another consideration leading us to the spirit of this text is the assurance that the Lord will provide somehow. He, will he who holds the water in the hollow of his hand allow his children to die of thirst? The faith of Jesus Christ is the grandest influence to make a man contented. Against all financial and spiritual harm, it calms the spirit dwindles the earth into insignificance and swallows up the soul with thought of heaven. I'm telling you, when trials come into your life and God allows those vexations of spirit to come and those, and those afflictions to come, all the nonsense just leaves your mind and heart right away. There is a clearing of all of it out of your life and heart. There is a sobriety that comes in through the trials and you wake up and, and figure out what's really important. The vanity leaves. 
It leaves when the trial comes. And lastly, the most important point, I think, is Paul said he learned how to be content. Contentment is never learned with the mere life of ease. You can't learn that. If God made everything easy on you, you would never learn to be content. You wouldn't. These words signify how being content may be attained, and it is not an endowment innate to us, but it is a product of discipline. Uh, Paul said, I already knew. No. He said, I have learned. You know, I can imagine that when Paul was in the dungeon, there were times that he was not content. Yep. Paul wasn't perfect. He even said it, of whom I am chief, right? Yep. He was an example to us, amen? And what did he say? He had some problems. He had to learn some things. Yep. He had to learn to be content, which means that he wasn't content before, <laughs> Right? He had to learn to be content. Philippians 4.11, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am, man, I mean, think about this for a second, will you? <laughs> he said, Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. He said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. He learned it. That is to have a contented mind. Paul says that he had learned this by the nature. By nature, he had he had a mind prone to impatience just as others. But he'd been in circumstances fitted to produce a different state of feelings. Remember when God said to him, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake? I'm going to remove him far away to the Gentiles. I'm taking him far away. And I'm going to show him. Well, how did he learn that? Well, turn to 2 Corinthians. You're going to see how he learned it. I don't know. You're like, I don't know if I want this lesson. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse number 23, he said, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a deep I have been in the, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, <laughs> in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Yep. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Yeah. Oh, that's how Paul learned it. He learned it through it all. And that's how you and I learn it too, the same exact way. Through trials, through perils, through dangers, through death, through life. He knew how to abase. How? Because he had been abased. If God always gives you all the financial, everything taken care of, everything abundant, everything, you won't trust God. You won't learn to trust the Lord. So what happened? He had to learn to abase. He had to learn it. Then he had to learn to abound. What does that mean? He had to learn to abound as, he, as God had given him plenty how his attitude should be, how he should deal with that, how he should distribute that, how his, that he'd not get lifted up with pride because of the blessings of the Lord, that God had given him much, that he was careful how he dealt with it, that he was a faithful steward, he said. That a man may be found faithful in stewards, right? He learned all the trials he'd went through. He had had abundant time for reflection, and he had found that there was grace enough in the gospel to enable him to bear trials. 
the considerations by which he had been taught this. He doesn't state all of them specifically right there. A spirit of patience does no good. It remedies no evil, and it supplies no want. That God could provide for him in a way which he could not foresee. And that the Savior was able abundantly to sustain him. A contented mind is an invaluable blessing. and is one of the fruits of religion in the soul. It arises from the belief that God is right in all his ways. You say, I've never doubted that. Yes, you have, and so have I. Yep. We do it often yep. because we complain about our situation. We complain about the lot we've been given. We complain about the trials that we have, and what are we saying? God, you're not right because this is coming my way, and it shouldn't be, and I know more than you, God, and I know that I don't need this trial. I need this to work smooth, and I need this, and I need this to go the way I want it to go. Right? That I don't deserve this trial. Well, you deserve, I know, you deserve a lot worse. So do I. Right? You know, I've always said this to people when, when the Lord showed me this. You never get out of the trial until you learn the lesson God has for you in it. You don't get out of it. No. You'll stay in it until you learn what God wants you to learn. When you do, you move on to the next one. <laughs> Amen? Move on to the next one. We have to, God is right in all his ways. That's what must be said in all of our trials. God is right. He's right. You know, I thought, I, I remember last year and all the trials that we went through and the things that God had brought us through. And it wasn't uh, the breaking point for the Lord to shine that light through and Give me that grace to get through that. God had showed me a very difficult lesson that I'm not going to pull you out of this one, but I will pull you through it. Amen. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, but I'm not pulling you out of it. I'm going to pull you through it yes. because you need it. And when I was able to accept that, by his grace, and submit to that, that glorious light started shining. Hope filled my heart. And I began to get through it by the grace of God. But it wasn't until I said, Lord, you're right, I deserve it, and I need what you're giving me. I don't understand it. And I don't like it, <laughs> but you're right. And then God began to show the failures and the problems and the challenges and the faults, and repentance came and strength came. Amen. Why should we be impatient, restless, or discontented? What evil will be remedied by it? What want of supply, what calamity removed? He that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. The heart that is fixed on the Lord will be at peace. A sensibility to the divine hand. Paul saw God in his trials and said, Thy will be done. Whew. We must be willing to say that through any trial. Yep. It's a very different thing to submit under the ills of life through a realization of their divine appointment and to submit from a soulness or a stupidity. Paul hoped in God. No man can be contented without hope. Paul understood that whatever state he was in, that there was a contentedness in his heart and a certain expectation that God was going to deliver him. Whether it was through it or out of it, he was going to deliver him. Just like those Hebrew children said when they were in that lion's den. They were at peace. Or not the lion's in the fiery furnace. He said, we are not careful to answer thee, O king. If we burn, we burn. But we ain't bowing. Amen. They knew either way, our God is able to deliver us. If we burn alive in here, we're delivered. 
If we come out unspotted, we're delivered. Either way, we're delivered. Amen. Paul had these experiences, and he understood that his treasure was in heaven. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, and even in prosperity, this consolation is required. You know, there's a lot of people that have abundance, and they're dissatisfied with it. Paul had these experiences which tried him. His content did not arise from finances, but it was faith and hope and heavenly mindedness. His painful experiences gave strength to his contentment. He was able to be an example to others, and that's the thing that you and I are able to do when God has brought us through a trial. If God always delivers us out of a trial, we cannot help others with that. But when he delivers us through it, when he brings us through it and gives us grace to endure it, he will either give you grace to endure it or he'll take you out of it. And if he gives you the grace to endure it, you can be an example to others. Paul's painful experiences gave strength and contentment and made successful trials light. They taught him to say, when I am weak, I am strong. Paul knew that when he was weak, he was dependent on God. And God was able to strengthen him. Contentment is very important in this Christian life. Having a heart that's at peace, not that's covetous, doesn't need everything, doesn't an inordinate affection and desire for other things that they don't need, but is content on what the Lord gives, whether it's a spouse, children, family, finances, a home, a church, right? Learning that whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Father, Lord, help us to remember that. Help us, Lord, as we go through our lives and as you take us through many trials and hardships that we can see your hand in it all and that we trust that our Heavenly Father has guided us through it all and will be there for us and will never leave us nor forsake us and what contentment that can bring in our lives and faith can grow from that, Lord. Please work in our hearts, Lord. Work in our hearts a contentment. Help us to surrender and submit to your will. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.